Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Faith Community Church. If you're new or visiting or just not sure who I am, my name is Russell. I am so glad that you made it a priority to be in church today, and I am honored that you chose to do that with us here at Faith Community. Uh, as we begin our service this morning, I want to take some time to direct you to our church website. There's a number of things on there that uh, uh, warrant your attention, so even right now, this is a good time to head there. Uh, www.woodstockfcc.com woodstockfcc faith community church.com and uh, there's a few things I want to direct your attention to the first is I would be so honored if you would take the time to fill out a connect card uh, what a blessing it is to know that you yes you have joined us for church today uh, even if that means you're watching this a week from now but go out and fill out that connect card it takes you two minutes and it just gives us a record of your visit with us it lets us know that you are out there joining us online for church. And uh, more importantly than just that, it gives us a chance and an opportunity to pray with you and to pray for you. So even now, this is a great time. Fill out that Connect card. Let us know that you joined church today. Uh, a number of uh, other things on the website to direct your attention to. Um, if you'd like to support our church and ministries with uh, your finances financially, you can do so directly from the website. You click the button that says Give Now or Give at the top and it will give you the different ways that you can support our church. You can do it digitally through e-transfer or securely with credit or debit directly through our website and you'll see the instructions there. Or if you'd like to give with cash or check, you can contact the church and we'll arrange for a safe pickup or drop off. Or if you can hold off for one more week, you could drop it off yourself at church because on June 27th, we will be doing our grand reopening of the church building. We are going to have in-person services. You'll see a little blurb about that on the website if you're already there. Or if you receive our weekly email, you should have uh, gotten an email this week about it, and you'll see some more information come out about it next week. But let me give you the important details. Because we are severely limited in capacity in our building, we have to be down to 15% of the sanctuary capacity, which for us means about 30 people we have to take registration. That means if you would like to be in church on June 27th, we need you to let us know. We have set up a way for you to register. You'll see it on the church website. It goes live on Monday uh, tomorrow. It goes live tomorrow at about 10 a.m. If you go to our website, you'll see a link there to fill out a registration card. It's very simple. It should be straightforward. Uh, and if you fill that out, let us know who's coming with you so we know how many people are coming. You need to reserve your spot if you want to be there on Sunday morning because our space is so limited. It, it's, if you just show up, we might have to turn you away. And we don't want to do that. So we want to make sure that we know who's coming and then we can let others know if, if the sanctuary capacity is filled, that they should be joining us online for that service. And this is a very temporary thing we have to do. We anticipate uh, as um, the restrictions become less, even as we get back to 25 or 30% capacity, we anticipate not needing to do this anymore, but at the 15% capacity, uh, with only 30 people allowed in, uh, we, we felt that this is a, a necessity so that we're not turning people away at the door. So you need to register for service. And for those of you who are saying, I'm not very good with technology, I don't know if I'll be able to do that, just reach out to me. Contact me directly. You can find all of my contact information on the website or you likely already have it. And uh, I will help you, I'll walk you through that process, or I'll just register you myself. So please, please, please make sure if you would like to come in person on June 27th, one week from the today, you need to register first. And uh, again, just contact me if you're having trouble, can't figure it out, or, or anything like that. And I will be happy to work with you to make sure that your spot is reserved. And again, this is a very temporary thing. We don't anticipate needing to do this for very long. Um, for those of you who maybe are still not quite comfortable coming out, that's fine. Or maybe you have been joining us online and you just simply don't live in the area. And it's just a, too far of a commute, but you want to still continue to worship alongside us and be a part of our church family. By all means, continue to do so. We love that we now have a larger church family and some of it is just strictly online. And we are working on ways to expand our ministry to reach and to connect with our online church family as well as the ones that can meet in the physical building. So if you are one of those online people or you're just not quite yet comfortable, 
not to worry, all of our services will be live streamed from the sanctuary. Starting again next week on June 27th, you won't miss a thing. The service will be live streamed, so you'll be a part of it. You'll still be able to chat with the others that are watching online and be a part of our church family that way. Uh, part then, I guess, of this announcement to train is to remind you that if you're not receiving those weekly updates, if a lot of what I'm saying is new information, it, it means you need to sign up for these emails. I don't spam your inbox. Usually it's just one email a week, usually with a short devotional, and then I, I keep you completely up to date with everything going on at our church, such as the reopening. And so I really want to encourage you, if you're not, to sign up for that weekly uh, update that weekly newsletter is very simple from woodstockfcc.com our church website scroll right down to the bottom you'll see a big blue box that says join our newsletter it just takes a first name and an email you hit submit you're done once a week straight to your inbox everything that's going on at faith community church the by far easiest way to stay up to date with all of the information i want to then continue to remind you as restrictions become less and less to um, listen and heed the advice of our health officials and our governmental leaders. And, and again, more importantly, to do what the scripture tells us to do is to lift them up in prayer. Let's be in prayer for our leaders and, and let's heed their advice. And again, the advice is very simple and very practical ways that we can show tangible love to others. It's keep distance when you can't wear a mask and uh, wash your hands frequently. And so we are so excited about uh, the, the restrictions lessening, about the possibility of having a, a larger church family, even bigger than the 30 that we're going to be currently allowed starting next week. And so we encourage you to keep doing your part, and I know many of you are, and so I thank you for that too. I want to uh, lead you into worship with this call to worship from Psalm 47. Listen to these words. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy, for the Lord Most High is awesome. The great King over all the earth, he subdued the nations under us, people under his feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of God of Abraham. For the kings of the earth belong to God. For he is greatly exalted. Welcome to church this morning.
Well, good morning once again, and welcome to Faith Community Church. Uh, if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know we are working our way through a, a series about identity. We're calling it, Who Am I? And perhaps even more specific than just general identity, we are looking to answer the question, what does it mean to find our identity in Christ? Or said more pointed, what does it mean to be in Christ? And how does that, finding my identity in Christ, practically impact my life? So that's what we're working on through this series. We, we, we began the conversation a number of weeks ago by realizing that we are created creatures, which at its most basic level tells us this, that we are not the creator. And because we are not the creator, because we are created creatures, it, it means that we are dependent on and accountable to someone else, mainly the creator, or we could say, God. And last week we discussed how all of humanity, you and me and your neighbor and everyone else, we are all represented by one of two men. The, the Bible says we are either represented by Adam or by Christ, or said it this way, you are either in Adam or you are in Christ. You are either in Adam and you're under the consequences of his actions, or you are in Christ and under the benefits of his actions. And that's where we're going to turn to today, for, and ultimately for the rest of the series, we're going to be looking at what are the benefits of being in Christ? What actually happens when I am, quote unquote, in Christ, belonging to Christ, united to Christ? And we're going to spend the rest of the series looking at that. What, what does that actually mean? And what does that practically mean? And, and so specifically today, then, we're going to look at what did Jesus come to earth to do? And how does what he did affect us? But first, let's pray. Father, we are again so grateful for your deep and immense love for us. We pray as uh, the service unfolds that we would be in step with you and your spirit where you are leading and guiding us. And Lord, we, we trust that you are, you have prepared hearts to hear this message, maybe not even now on Sunday morning, but later in this week or maybe even a year from now, Lord, we trust that you have prepared hearts to hear this specific message. And Lord, my prayer is, as I stand here, as I go through my prepared materials, I, I pray that it would be of you, and if it's not, if it's, it's a, if it's about me in any way, I pray that you would tear down those walls and people would see less of me and more of your Holy Spirit, I pray, that you would intercede between the words that I'm saying and the words that those are hearing. So each person does not hear a message from Russell, but they hear from you. Give me the courage and the wisdom to follow your leading. If that means scrapping some plans I made, Lord, so be it. I hand the service over to you for you to do with it what you will. We pray this in your name. Amen. So, this morning we're going to discuss what is perhaps the most important aspect of being in Christ. Uh, one of the most important benefits or, or things that we gain from being in Him or belonging to Him or being united with Him. And it's simply this, I am justified. I am justified. See, if you are in Christ, if you trust in him, if you put your faith in him, then you are justified. This is at the very core of the gospel message, yet so many don't have a good or firm understanding of what it means. And so we're going to talk about it today, and today I hope... Uh, by the end of this time, by the end of this service, you leave knowing what it means to be justified and how you have become justified. And so I want to start the conversation by looking at Galatians 2. We're going to look at verses 15 and 16. Galatians 2, 15 and 16, it says, We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. 
this term justified justification uh, this term it's it's a legal term it's something you would hear in a courtroom and maybe that's why we don't hear it or use it very much nowadays uh, but it's crucial that we understand it it's it's crucial that we who are in Christ know what it means as it's a core aspect of our identity in Christ. Uh, author Jerry Bridges, I've talked about him a few times this series, he, he wrote a small book uh, about identity in Christ and it's, it's been uh, incredibly impactful and it's actually set the skeleton of this sermon series for me. Uh, he, he said it this way, he does a great job, he says, to be justified means that one has been declared right according to the appropriate law. He goes on and says, To be justified means to be declared righteous by God with respect to his law. It also means to be accepted and treated by God as such. Okay, I want to stop here. I, I want to just take a breath here and let you rest, just in case you missed what has just been said, because it's pretty impactful. To be justified means that God has declared you righteous with respect to his law. It means that God looks at you and declares you righteous and treats you as such. But, but wait, you might say, how is this possible? You might ask, how is this possible? Uh, you might be asking, as I ask, how can God declare me as righteous with respect to his law when in reality... I have not been obedient to it in so many ways, not only in the past, but also, truthfully, on a more or less regular basis. How can God declare me as righteous? And this is such a crucial and important question to ask because the answer points us to one of the most extremely important truths in all of Scripture. Uh, the fact that we are justified despite regularly breaking the law of God tells us that we uh, are n now and can we can't ever be justified by what Paul calls in the Galatian passage the works of the law. Let me say that again because I stumbled through it. I want to make sure you get it. The fact that we are justified despite regularly breaking the law of God tells us that we cannot now or ever be justified by works of the law. That's what Paul calls it in the Galatians passage. You know, I was sharing um, with someone recently uh, that it feels like my university days are, are just in the very near past. Like I just got out in uh, maybe a year or two ago, um, but in reality, if you look at a calendar, which I suppose is a good thing to do once in a while, uh, I found out that it wasn't a year or two or three or even five, but more like eight years ago that I left university, and that's hard for me to believe. I'm not afraid of getting older, but it just doesn't seem that far away. But it's so long ago, eight years ago, it's hard for me to believe. Yet, despite it actually being so far in the past, I still remember quite a lot about school. Maybe not all the details of the test and stuff, but I, I remember some big picture things. Uh, and for instance, and the point here is this, I remember that to receive a passing grade all I have to do is achieve a 50. 50%. 50 All I have to do is achieve a 50% in the course and I'll get a passing grade. You know, and I, I've heard of some schools that are a little more strict and maybe they have 60% is a, a passing grade. But in either case, in all of my schooling, my elementary, my high school, my university, and even taking some extra courses online, uh, I've yet to hear of a school that says, to receive a passing grade, you are required to get 100% in the course. I've never heard of a school like that. And you might be thinking about now, okay, why are you bringing this up? I'll tell you why. Here's the point. This system of grading that we've learned from our educational system has been hardwired into our brains, and we have begun to transfer it over to different parts of our life, and specifically for my point this morning, we've transferred it over to our spiritual lives. And we assume, because this system of grading is hardwired into our brains and our life, that God must be using a similar standard and rubric for grading our lives. So we might say, well... I haven't lived a perfect life, but I certainly, you know, if 
I'm grading on a curve here. I, I probably deserve a 70 or around there for how I lived, right? I wasn't so bad. Not perfect, but not so bad. Or, or you might be thinking, okay, at worst case scenario, I know uh, for how I lived my life, I at least got a 50. So that should be a passing grade. That should be good enough. But I want you to hear the words from Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. It says this, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Uh, Paul here, he's laying out what the standard is, what we're actually measured by. And he says, we can only be justified by our works, by our obedience to the law, if we keep in absolute perfect obedience to all of the requirements listed within it. And you've probably heard people talk about this, but in the Old Testament, there's uh, a little more than 600 laws given. And that in itself is an overwhelming thought uh, when you're trying to think about perfectly keeping all 600, uh, I think there's 612 of these laws. But even if we simplified it, all right, like, even if we simplified them all down, Jesus did actually, and he, he got it down to two. Even if we bring all those laws and those commandments down to two commands, we condense it down and we say all we have to do is to love God with all of our being and love others as ourselves. Even if we can bring it down to those two commands, can any of us, can you or I say that we have kept them perfectly? The answer is a resounding no. Jesus is the only person to have ever walked on earth and done that and perfectly kept them. And the point is this, if you are relying on works of the law, on your obedience to the law as a means for your justification, you will fail to meet the standard. In fact, instead of being counted as righteous by God, uh, it says here in that verse, it says, you will be under a curse. So you need to understand then that being justified through your own effort, by your own righteousness, through your adherence to the law, it does not and never will work. Okay, well, what's the other option? And if that doesn't work, there's got to be an option that does work because our passage tells us that God counts us as righteousness, as righteous. Here's the other option. This is what the Bible says. We are not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 explains it this way. It says, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let's again just slow down. Let's sit here a minute and break this verse down. Um, this is so important that we understand what this is saying. Uh, we can see there's three people mentioned in this verse. We have God, we have Jesus, and then there's us, you and me, and everyone else. Uh, let's, let's look at all three of these people and, and make sure we have a firm understanding of uh, the roles of these people and the impact it has for us. So let's first look at Christ. It says that God made him... Uh, the hymn, of course, referring to Jesus. God made Jesus sin, even though he had no sin or knew no sin. Uh, so, so Jesus, we, we need to understand, Jesus was not a descendant of Adam, right? And because of that, he did not inherit a, a sinful nature. Well, you and I have inherited our sinful disposition from our forefather Adam, resulting in us, as we talked about last week, being spiritually dead, slaves to sin, and in opposition to God, Jesus, he was none of these things. Jesus was perfectly devoted to and perfectly obeyed God the Father. Let's look at a few verses that bear this out. Hebrews 4.15 says, Jesus had been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. 1 Peter 2.22, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his Mouth, or perhaps most simply put, is from 1 John 3, 5. It says, in him, in Christ, in Jesus, is no sin. So when the verse refers to Jesus, we have to first understand that Jesus was completely and utterly sinless. He was spiritually alive. He was free from sin, and he was in perfect union with God. Let's take a look at what the verse says about God now. 
It says that God, God the Father, made him, that is Jesus. It says God made him to be sin. Uh, he made him take on our sin is what it's saying. And, and let's be careful in our understanding of what's being said here. When it says God made, it's not saying God forced, okay? That's not what it's saying. Because Jesus, in his perfect obedience, willingly obeyed God the Father. So rather than meaning force, it means something more like God desired. Uh, saying that God desired Christ to become sin on our behalf is not saying God was excited to punish Jesus. That's not what it means. Uh, listen to this verse from Ephesians. It might explain it a little better. Ephesians 1, 4-5, it says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. You see, God planned, even before he made the world, to send Jesus to come and die in your place to be made sin. That's what it means. Why? So that you and I might be justified. Isaiah 53, 6 says it this way, We, all like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You and I, we have all gone astray. We have all disobeyed. We have all turned from doing what God wants us to do to doing what we want to do or what feels good to us. Said another way, we have all sinned. But it continues by saying God has laid on him that is the Messiah, Christ, the iniquity of us all. Take a second, again, just really slow down and meditate on that. Think about what is being said there. It's, it's for our sake, for the sake of a sinner like me, God placed my sin and the punishment for it on Christ. Why? So that all who are in him, all who have faith in him, would be counted as righteous and thus justified. So that the last person in this verse, who are we? The last person in that verse from the second Corinthians passage, I mean, I guess I just gave it away. We are sinners. We are, as we talked about last week, in Adam. We are spiritually dead, slaves to sin, in opposition to God. Paul describes us elsewhere as enemies of God. And it's for us that Jesus became sin. Why? Why? It says, so that we might become righteous. This is really important uh, because I think we often miss half of, uh, of what happens through atonement and justification. I, I think we mostly think about justification as Jesus taking our sins on himself, Jesus bearing the punishment of our sins. And that's true and that is right, but that's only half of what happens. See, it's not just that Jesus takes your sins. It's not just that your sins have been moved from you, past, present, and future sins, onto Jesus and crucified with him on the cross, but it is also that we receive his righteousness. His righteousness gets credited to us as our own. That's what this verse is explaining, that when Christ became sin, he took all of your sin, and they were all credited to him, and he bore the punishment, but he also did something else. He took his perfect righteousness. It's called the righteousness of God. And he credited it to you. It's been given to you. And you reap the benefits of his perfect obedience. Let me see if I can make that clear. Justification has two parts. It means that your sins are forgiven. Your debt has fully been paid by Christ taking it on himself. That's the first part. The second part means that the perfect righteousness of Christ has been fully credited to you as your own. Uh, Bridges says it so well. He says, you can understand being justified as meaning these two things. It means God sees you just as if you had never sinned. And God sees you just as if you had always obeyed. Listen, that's how God sees you. Because you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, or 
or said another way, that's how God sees you. Why? Because you are in Christ. You belong to him. You are united to him. And I know it might be redundant at this point to say this, but I want to make sure that you leave understanding, knowing how we get this. How do you get this justification? How do you get this righteousness of Christ? How do you become justified? If we go back to the scripture we began with, Galatians 2, uh, 15 and 16. Let me read it again. It says this. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ Jesus. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ Jesus and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. It should be abundantly clear, stated three times in these two verses. The answer is simply this. A person is not justified by the law, but by what? Faith in Jesus Christ. What does it practically do for you to put your faith in Christ? Two things. First, it means uh, acknowledging that you are helpless to help yourself. If you're wondering, how do I uh, live out faith in Christ? You know, it's a good concept to talk about. What, what does it mean in my life? It means first you have to acknowledge that you are helpless to help yourself. You are a created creature under the consequences of Adam, which means no matter how good you are, you will never meet the standard. And this is a really difficult thing to talk about. It's very difficult to accept in our current culture because it sounds like I'm hitting you and putting you down, but I'm not. I'm trying to point out the reality of the situation that the Bible makes so abundantly clear because if we miss this, we miss the beauty of the gift that Christ gives us. So first, uh, we have to... Uh, Acknowledge that we are helpless to help ourselves. You know, again, we, we, we just we like to think that on our really, really good days that God, he must be so pleased with me. Uh, and you know what? I, I do think God is happy when you do have those really good days, when you make good and wise decisions, when you're obedient to what he wants you to do. But the reality is, as we looked at today, that no matter how good you are, you'll never be able to keep the law of God perfectly. And that in itself tells us that we cannot be justified by our own effort. So listen, to put your faith in Jesus, first, practically, it means that you have to renounce any trust in your own per per personal perceived righteousness. You have to renounce it. And second, it means this. We need to acknowledge that we are completely dependent on Him, on Christ, for all things. We must rely wholeheartedly with all that we are utterly on the finished work of Christ, both in his life and death. And that is how we are justified. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we are so grateful for your gift. We're so grateful that you love us in such a deep and profound way that you didn't leave us where we were when we were so helpless to help ourselves, but that you came, and this was your plan all along. This wasn't just a, a band-aid fix, but you planned this even before you created the earth. You knew it would cause pain, yet you went through it anyways, just so that you could have a chance at having a relationship with us, so that you could take our sin and give us your righteousness, that you could justify us. And Lord, we are so grateful Lord, today uh, I renounce and um, I, I call on others to renounce to uh, my own perceived righteousness. I renounce any trust in it. Lord, I can't do it. But you have already done it. And I am so thankful. I'm so thankful that not only have you taken my sins away, but you have given me your righteousness. And Lord, I pray that we all go forth from this service knowing just how immensely loved we are, that you clothe us in your righteousness. We give you thanks. We give you thanks. We give you thanks. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, something we do at the end of every service here at Faith Community is called Take Two. This is where we take two minutes 
to uh, answer two questions. And the first question is this. What is one thing God is saying to you? Ask God. Ask him directly. Say, God, what is one thing you are saying to me? What are you trying uh, to get across? What message are you speaking to? It, it could be from the sermon itself. Maybe just one of the scriptures jumped off uh, the screen to you. Or, or maybe uh, it was from the song or just another aspect of the service. I don't know. Uh, that's between you and God, but take that time and ask God, what are you trying to say to me? And then listen. And then very importantly, don't leave it there. Go to the second question, which says this, what does God want you to do about it? Ask God, now that you've spoken to me, I've heard from you, what do you want me to do about it? What act of obedience are you asking me to carry out? What do you want me to do? So we're going to give you two minutes to answer those two questions and to reflect on the service this morning. Then I'll come back and I'll close this. So... We'll give you the two minutes, so I'll put the timer up and start it right now. so much for joining our service this morning. I'm so glad that you made that decision to be here with us. I hope to see many of you next week, some of you in person. I hope to connect with some of you online still. Uh, just again, reminder, if you would like to join us in person June 27th for our, our reopening of the church building, you need to pre-register. Check the church website tomorrow, tomorrow morning, Monday, 10 a.m. Uh, the link should be live so that you can register. Let us know you're coming, reserve your spot. And, and of course, you'll see a whole bunch of other information that you need to know and read through before coming back to the building so that you know what we are doing to keep you safe and what we expect you to do to keep those around you safe. So I encourage you to check that all out tomorrow morning, Monday morning, 10 a.m. It'll be live on the church website. And I'm just so excited to see many of you that way. Let, let me close our service this morning with the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Would you go with that peace this morning? Thanks for joining. <laughs>